Support the Amigos podcast and keep the Amiga goodness flowing for just a dollar a month. Visit our page at patreon.com slash Amigos podcast. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Amigos, the podcast about everything Amiga. Amigos is a proud member of the Throwback Network, your home for quality retro podcasts. And now, here are your hosts, Aaron Dowdy and John Bodokar Schaller. Hi, and welcome to the Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today, we are going to continue our Halloween spooktacular with three games featuring everyone's favorite Mistress of the Dark, Elvira. But before we get started... Um, I thought we'd give you a little peek into uh, our personal lives. Now, I don't get scared. Uh, I was hoping Aaron could share an experience he had uh, this past weekend uh, going out to a haunted house, which is kind of a tradition in uh, in the United States. During Halloween, you go to a haunted house and uh, you get scared, supposedly. So, uh, Aaron, tell us about your adventure. Sure. Uh, me, my girlfriend, my buddy Matt, and a few other folks and my, my girlfriend is a uh, local history slash paranormal slash uh, tour guide so she's really into ghost houses and that sort of thing so she kind of drove me on to this thing but we went to what's known as the Fallbergs Kentucky Fearplex which is a uh, supposedly a five five haunted areas in one tour now when we say haunted areas and again for people that don't live in the states these are, uh, you know, they're fake. The people, they're actors. They come out and they, they jump out of stuff and they, there's props and there's, you know, and they try to scare you. Uh, we uh, went down to Fallsburg, Kentucky, which is, even for Kentucky, is out in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing happening out there. I've been through there many times and they have a little tiny waterfall that their town's named after. And that's it. And they have one gas station. But uh, every, every, uh, end of september through end of october the town's population god knows goes up by a thousand percent for a million people to come and park their cars in the middle of this field to go to the fear plex and so i was numbered myself amongst them this saturday uh we went out uh the tickets for this thing were 22 bucks each american plus three bucks for parking which is horrifying. That was the sc- second scariest part of the evening as I laid down the cash for this extravaganza. Then we proceeded to wait in an uh, empty field for two and a half hours while we waited to in, our, in line to gain access to the Fearplex. Uh, the uh, wait was boring, monotonous, and rain-soaked as it rained part of the time we were there. Finally, after that, we uh, gained access to the first part of the Fearplex, which was, was a haunted cornfield, which was... Uh, walking through a big cornfield and while people jump out and basically scream. That was it. <laughs> were uh, the people dressed up? I mean, were they, they were, like zombies? The theme, the theme of this cornfield were these were uh, cannibal hillbillies. Oh, okay. And so being uh, in West Virginia, <laughs> it doesn't bother me at all. And I'm just, <laughs> this is a day, that's normal just a day normal day. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll go to a lot of detention centers in my job and cannibal hillbillies <laughs> to fit right in those detention centers. So we went through that. It lasted about, oh, three minutes. Then we went to the Haunted Trail, which goes to the hillbilly village where they're cooking people up and they're yelling boo <laughs> and jumping out from behind stuff. Uh, the Haunted Village, that was the third scariest part of the tour, was the incredible uphill slant I had to walk after standing <laughs> around in the rain for two and a half hours to get up this haunted trail. Uh, we made it up there. The third part of the Fear Plex was a haunted house. Uh, which we went in. The fourth scariest thing on the trip, going up the stairs in this haunted house. It was brutal. Uh, there was a, it was a rooms you would go into. Now, was this was this a, an actual house? At this some was point an actual in house. In fact, my uh, girlfriend's buddy, uh, who was one of her ghost hunter buddies, said that this house is actually haunted. So I don't know if I was a ghost. I don't know if I'd be down with this or not. It'd be kind of <laughs> it's almost insulting. What right. my haunting's exactly. not good enough for you? <laughs> Uh, we uh, ran through this house. It was pretty standard fare. People jumped out and went boo. People grabbed your legs. They had little trap doors. The one interesting part of the thing was there was a room where these weird larval sacks hung from the ceiling, and you had to walk through this. Uh, they're almost like body bags, I guess, and that was pretty creepy. There was a strobe light going on, but 
that was pretty much it. That lasted about, let's say, five minutes. It'll be charitable. Now, whenever I, I go to a haunted house, which the last time I did was when I was smaller than I am now, there's always something at the end that's chasing you that's making you leave in a rapid manner. Is, does that still go on? Nope. <laughs> Nothing chased us. <laughs> I was in the rear for some of this. We just meandered through. Uh, we got out of that, and then the scariest part of the whole night was, was the next item, which was we had to hop on the back of a tractor pulled cart with hay on it and ride through the streets of Fallsburg to get to the next part of the fear place. <laughs> there was no back on this truck. If you were to tumble out, you would die horribly, horribly. You'd be mangled. And uh, uh, me and my girlfriend held on to each other like grim death as we drove through the streets of Fallsburg, which are unpaved doom. Uh, we finally arrived at the fourth part of the fear place, which was the dark maze. It's a pitch black maze. This is you the just, second maze of the evening. Yeah. The, the, really, the corn maze was ill named because really it was just like a straight alley through the <laughs> corn. It's in, the only way you can get lost if you just meandered out in the corn. This was a legitimate maze, but it doesn't matter because you can't see anything. It's pitch black. They had lights on the wall. I will say I got a, a terrible surprise when I touched the wall at one point and it shocked the holy hell out of me. <laughs> and I was, I, I worked with electronics, so this was on a hell of a shock because I've been shocked many times. So that was kind of neat. You go through this maze, basically. Uh, our, my buddy Matt the way and he just he was our flunky he just ran it into people he ran into walls <laughs> so that was pretty funny the final part of the fearplex was the best part which was the the uh, 3d section of the fearplex which you put on 3d glasses and they've taken fluorescent paint and painted this area in three in a 3d way um they told me the guy that painted this was the same artist that worked on for rob zombie I don't know what that means, but that sounds cool. I like Rob Zombie, so this was awesome. It was really awesome. There were monsters in there, guys with flesh of paint, but they, could, they didn't need to be there. This was more like art. Beautiful, cool 3D, uh, trippy as hell, uh, and uh, too short. It was very cool, but I wish there was more of that. And then wham, bam, we're done at, at a slim trim. Uh, well, we got there at about 8.15, so we're talking about f five hours or so of the Fearplex, of which... I don't know, maybe a half hour was actually inside the fear, the fear plex. So I'm going to give the Fallsburg fear plex a thumbs down. It's too expensive. You wait too long. But I won't forget it. So I guess there's something there. And I won't forget that hayride. That was the scariest part of it. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, we went to a scary school a couple weeks ago, which I thought was a better deal, was more fun. The acting was better. Uh, so just goes to show you, stick to your local neighborhood stuff a lot of times. And the, and the, and the uh, Fallsburg Fearplex is nationally ranked. Yes, we have rankings for this stuff in America. Uh, and so, you know, they were the last of the nationally ranked, 25th out of 25 last year. But, you know, eh, I, I think I'll take a pass next year and just watch a scary movie, like Fright Night. Well, that sounds like uh, an experience that I'm glad I was not in attendance for. Yes. Um, so, uh, anyway... Thank you for sharing that. No uh, problem. Now we're going to move on now that the, the mood has been set. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, we're going to talk about Elvira. So, uh, Aaron, why don't you tell us a little bit about Elvira, the, the person? Um, her name was Cassandra, or it should say is, uh, Cassandra Peterson. Uh, for those, and she was, a, um, she was a worldwide phenomenon to a certain degree, at least the English-speaking world, I guess. She's a hot well, gothy looking, uh, slinky chick with a really low cut dress and big, huge, colossal boobs. And she watches, she usually hosts um, horrible, cheesy movies, horror movies, makes funny comments, sort of funny. You know, the one thing about Elvira, she knows where, she knows where her bread is buttered. She's a hot chick in a, in a hot dress being hot. Their jokes are horrible. The movies are crap. And no one's watching this stuff to watch her crappy films. They want to see her slinking around laying on a couch, stuff like that. She was a big deal for a while on the stage. She's got she's got these three games. She's got two highly regarded pinball machines. There's rumors that she could be in another pinball machine here soon. Really? Yeah. I hadn't heard that. I keep hearing it banded around. So uh, that would be kind of neat. Uh, if she's still pretty well known, you know. Uh, so and she of course she merchandised and you know on everything and she she actually had her own movie, Elvira or Mr. Dark which was out in I think eighty eight, uh, which was schlocky and horrible, and uh, what else would you expect right? Uh, and she was but I didn't realize how uh, big a phenomenon she was worldwide 
until I started looking at this stuff for this this week's games. It's uh, it's pretty popular, and the games were real well received, especially in the UK. Uh, but they were they were translated into uh, several languages, uh, like Italian, French. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. assumably, they wouldn't have translated those to those languages if, if uh, she wasn't well known enough to have had the game released. And so, apparently, the games did real well. And uh, uh, if you see her now, it's funny. Even back then, without her stuff on, she just looks like a, a she's a nice looking older woman now who's just looks like your average person. She doesn't look like she's a huge this hot stack chick. She's just like a regular chick, you know. But uh, you know, she was featured in a lot of stuff. She was very popular, and uh, she had some good stuff. Uh, like I said, the pinball machines are real well regarded. I've had a chance to play both her pinball machines, and they're excellent. And having played all these games. Uh, they're not bad. No, uh, no, overall, as far as licensed property goes, uh, these are these are pretty well done, well done games. Uh, so the first the first game uh, was released in 1990, right? Was that when Mistress of the Dark came out? I think I think you're right. Yeah, and uh, it is uh, regarded by some as one of the first survival horror video games. Which is sort of a stretch, I think. Yeah, probably. Um, but it was actually developed by a company called Horror Soft <laughs> and uh, released by Accolade in 1990. Um, you know, I kind of feel like you're painting yourself into a corner when you name your company Horror Soft in terms of, you know, what games uh, you uh, you can release. But, you know, apparently that they thought they were going to be a horror company until they changed their name. And they actually changed their name Adventure Soft. And, uh, you know, it's funny because they managed to uh, change their name uh, from Adventure Soft to Horror Soft and then back to Adventure Soft. So uh, they were kind of, I guess, cresting the wave of horror themed games. And once that wave ran aground, they just jumped back to their first name. That's I, re- I saw a quick interview with these guys, and uh, that's pretty much the way they spelled it out. They, they started out uh, working. They actually did a. a kind of an unknown game i'd never heard of it called personal nightmare that preceded the elvira stuff uh and that i think they did that under the adventure soft title under the uh, banner of adventure soft and they switched over to horror soft did the elvira stuff and they switched back um so the the game itself is uh you know just part of the grand tradition of of pc uh role-playing games where it's a first person's perspective uh similar to you know wizardry which i guess was the f- the first game set from that perspective it reminded me a lot of uh, eye of the beholder mm-hmm. that the uh the click and the arrows to move I, you know the interfaces i thought was pretty sharp yeah uh it uh you know, now it could have been a little smoother, but if you think about when it was from, I liked, I liked, I've always liked the idea of dragging stuff off the the game window in your inventory, which is cool. The movement was cool. It's the kind of game that uh, it doesn't really animate. It just as you push a push the direction, it sort of just quickly kind of shows you the next screen and to kind of simulate a 3D environment, which I thought, you know, again, that's pretty standard stuff. Dungeon Master did that, and a million games have done it, you know. But this was a, this was by far one of the better uh, interfaces I saw from that era. I thought it looked, I looked pretty sharp. Yeah, it definitely reminded me. Of course, you know, I was always a console gamer of Shadowgate. Did you ever play Shadowgate? I never did. But it's, it's very similar you know, exploring. And like you said, there's no animation, but when you click on things, stuff will appear. And, um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's easy to see how games like, you know, the Elder Scrolls and stuff kind of evolved out of this where, you know, you can take things that you might not necessarily need and add them to your inventory. You know, I, there was one, I think it was in the second game, actually, where you were in some kind of a garden and you're, you know, you're clicking herbs and dragging them into your inventory and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, very cool. I liked. Uh, there were a bunch of parts I liked. I didn't, I have, I'm not beating this game. I, I I did watch a guy go through the end of it. I'd gotten halfway through, a little more than halfway. Uh, there was, but one thing I liked about it, which I thought was clever, is they actually would put little tidbits of animation in it, and it was often quite good. The graphics in this are really good. I thought they were excellent. Uh, the uh, there's some neat stuff in it. The I liked the. Uh, there's a, there's a bit where you kill a guy who uh, kill a dude's falcon uh, who who comes at you with a crossbow, and then when you kill the falcon, uh, the uh, the falconer melts, <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> um, I liked uh, the uh, 
I like the fact that a lot of the chick monsters in these games, both the games, are just big boobed. Yeah, <laughs> I thought yeah. that was kind of funny. Good or bad, they're yeah. all in doubt. It's like, for example, there's a, a, the uh, uh, the vampire the vampire girl in this. Uh, you uh, you take the stake and kill her, and then you collect her ashes. And she's got big old you know boobs. Uh, there's a cook that you just got big old boobs and you throw salt on it. You know, it. Horror Soft, they knew, like, as you say, where their bread was buttered. Yeah. And uh, if you're tuning in to Elvira to play a game, you're looking for something. Well, the funny thing about this game is they could have, Horror Soft, to their credit, they could have just put something out, stuck Elvira all over it, and said, here we go. And just put, uh, but I mean, this guy, you could tell this thing oozes of style. These guys went the extra mile. The art is outstanding. The little animated sections, they didn't have to do that stuff, but they did. And it looks cool. I mm-hmm. mean, there's parts where walls crumble and where you get attacked by stuff. And it, and the combat is interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm not a Final Fight or Final Fantasy guy or, or these complicated stuff. So for me, the kind of combat in this was really good personally well you've got and what, what ends up happening is when you get attacked which is often you'll get you'll, a, a little window will pop up on on the right hand side of the screen and it, and you'll have the choice of two different attacks or two different blocks if you you can with your with your weapon you can lunge and ha- and hack those are the two options and i'm assuming it's a, it's a uh, rock paper scissors sort of a, sort of affair the uh, the opponent will will eat, i guess they will either parry or or block which are the other two things you can do and so if you get the one that you need to beat that you hit them and if not you don't and then they get their turn and you try to hit the button to block or 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 uh parry i thought it was cool uh i i because I, I like simple mm-hmm. you know my, one of my problems with like for example out of the beholder is like you're controlling any game where I've got to control multiple people, I just it it's too much. I'm I don't know, maybe I'm simple minded. I like I like when you're the guy, right? So I, I kind of dug that. Uh, the uh, there's a lot of interesting characters in it, you know, to, to fight. There's you know there's these weird kind of demon looking guys. There's a guy that uses a skull for a weapon and try to he basically has the skull in his hand. He tries to hit you with it and kind of bite you <laughs> you know i like that it's a, it's a kind of a wolf, crazy kind of a uh, uh uh wolf demon who's kind of pivotal because which i didn't this is i didn't get this far but i was, he's just he's just got to hit hit you with this certain stone that you need to unlock this wall that uh to uh get to the skeleton king who sits in the throne it's pretty cool something else i liked where there were different death scenes for your guy which i got killed early and often thank you per- perpetual save man because otherwise i'd have been killed a million times i probably was anyway but uh, uh sometimes your guy gets burned sometimes he gets bitten sometimes his fu- face gets slashed up with claws yeah. and sometimes and they always show that the, they always show your face after you die yes. in whatever mangled condition it ends up <laughs> which in. is awesome <laughs> i love that um it's almost always that same kind of headshot, but they mm-hmm. just put there. Sometimes you drown. There's sections where you got to go underwater. Uh, I mean, I used to play some very, very similar graphic adventures on the on the Coco, minus the dr- drag and drop. Uh, there, there are several other games on the Amiga that have that kind of drag and drop system, which is, they're, I just love them. It's great. Mm-hmm. I love that stuff. So, in terms of interface, I rate this highly. In terms of gameplay, I rate it highly because I like the way it works. The inventory screen's easy to get to. Uh, the uh, uh, it's an interesting game. Uh, you're, there's as a there's a spell component to the first game, a small one. Uh, the uh, uh, but most of it's you know most of your attacks and stuff are just swords and stuff. So I like that every once in a while, like you'll get a crossbow for that one, for you know that you can use in the Falcon, for example. Uh, but uh, cool game, and uh, it rated I well. enjoyed it. Um, you know, Computer Gaming World, uh, it won Computer Gaming World's uh, 1991 Role Playing Game of the Year. Um, I wonder what was out that year, because you got to think that. That's a prestigious honor yeah. to give to an Elvira game. Yeah. And that was probably the heyday of this sort of game, too. Uh, probably. I mean, I think that there's always uh, there's always been a steady stream of, of these kinds of games in the PC world. I just really think that it, it probably deserved it. You know, it's like you said, this isn't just a piece of licensed property where they just slapped Elvira on a terrible game and put it out. Uh, in fact, if they would have removed Elvira from this game completely, it wouldn't have lost anything. Yeah, they could have put a generic hot chick in there yeah. or any or anything, really. You know, And I don't think this game, the plot, really had anything to do with like her show or any lore. No. You know, uh, the, uh, the Imelda 
character that you had to go after. Uh, I don't. You know, I've watched a lot of Elvira stuff. I don't think I've ever remember that coming. Up. So it must be something they made ex- exclusively right. for the game. Right. Um, now Elvira Two uh, was released in 1992. Uh, it was also developed by Horsoft, published by Accolade. Um, and this time, you're actually you're the main character, and you're Elvira's boyfriend. So uh, they're trying to drag Elvira a little bit more into it this time. I'm assuming you're the same guy from the first because he looks identical. So I'm guessing maybe after the first one, they started dating. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Which, the, spoiler alert, but at the end of the first one, they imply that you're going home to score with Elvira. Yeah, it's in a... So there's, there's nothing shown, <laughs> but uh, that's just like, just like you're your coming over. Your reward yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, uh, this one... Um, you are uh, Elvira has been captured by the demon Cerebrus, uh, who wants to use her magical power for his own aims. Uh, what I thought was cool about this is that they they made it kind of like um, oh I don't know what they made it like, I, but what I what I always think of is at the end of uh, what's the Mel Brooks Western Blazing Saddles Love how it. they they crash through into the studio you know at yeah. the end <laughs> yeah. for, uh, you know this is not at all like that but that's what I thought of uh, where you are actually in a horror <laughs> movie studio where the props and in, in the sets have turned into actual monsters um, so uh, I guess it was a result of building the studio on uh, on haunted grounds which that old trick it know. amused me that I mean I, again this is a game that I did got even less further in than I did the first one but it, it, all, it amused me that you, here you are fighting Cerberus at the very end of this thing and you end up <laughs> you fight Cerberus in the parking lot basically it's <laughs> <laughs> effectively where you fight him and so you're and, and like I said when you look at this game and you go to these various areas they're all studio sets and uh it's very clever, I thought, and, and expansive as hell. Mm-hmm. This thing is huge. It is. It's uh, the the playthrough that I watched because I wanted to see the end of the game was three and a half hours long, and he wasn't dawdling around. I mean, it was just or whoever that was playing was just going through each step really quick. Uh, so if you were on your own trying to do this, you know, it would take you it would take you a long time to complete this game. I uh, um, I like what they did. I mean, this game is basically more of the same with a butt, and the butt is the combat. The uh, they really went after the magic root on this, which was cool. Uh, you gathered spell components. You had your you had a, a, a spells that you could use to fight the bad guys, or and not just that. You like telekinesis or raise dead or stuff. There were all kinds of spells you could use. There's a ton of spells in this. <laughs> Excuse me, and. Uh, uh, they were pivotal to, to the action. You know, at some point you'd have to like you use telekinesis to grab like a wallet, for example, and pull it off a guy. Uh, you have to like an, at one point you have to raise the dead on a, on a priest. You have to talk to the dead sometimes. The bad guys in this were pretty wild looking. Uh, not only were you just were you fighting like in the first game, you mostly fought like knights, and then sometimes you'd fight skeletal knights, but you were fighting like. Frankenstein, you know, stuff like you would actually have a Frankenstein come at you. There were vampires. There were different kinds of vampires in this, which I thought was neat. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, there were, I bet there were probably, oh gosh, I wouldn't even want to guess, maybe 20 spells in this. And, uh, uh, you know, you could, you had to, when you go out, for example, there's a garden level. That's probably what you were talking about. We had to go out and gather herbs and stuff. You know, there's spell components. You get, you go in, Elvira, help you mix some stuff up. The, uh, the fact that there were false Elviras in this that you end up having to tangle with, I thought was, was pretty interesting. This one here, I, I, I will admit, I did not get very far into back in the day. And when I get when I tried my hand this past week was, uh, it's a it's a I think this is a more difficult game. The first game is no easy trick either. It's a, it's a it's a pretty difficult game, uh, but uh, it's fun. I enjoyed it. I think they really kept the same formula that made the first one popular, but expanded on a pretty pivotal thing that was pretty simple in the first which was the you know was, was the spell combat yeah um this game was not as popular with the magazines for uh one simple reason um you could make several mistakes in the game that the game would not make you aware of that would make the game impossible to finish yeah i saw that i read it there i read a uh, walkthrough on this and it said here are the things if you don't have these you're screwed you know now something else i liked about it is there are multiple ways to get past stuff you can uh, brute force or you, you magic or you could also wear costume disguises to get past certain things which i thought that was kind of a neat angle too so i like stuff that have multiple paths oh, me too that's great um i guess my, my biggest complaint with both of these games is that when you think about what elvira is in real life you know it's campy you know it's kind of funny 
it would be great if these games reflected that a little bit. These games are super serious. You know, they're they're really leaning hard on the horror, um, and uh, which you know that's fine. But if I was going to make an Elvira game, I would make it sort of silly horror. Mm-hmm. Well, I will say one thing that's funny, and it's in both games, is that when you actually talk to Elvira before the game's over, she treats you like crap. <laughs> <laughs> she makes fun of you. She says you're an incompetent, brainless idiot. She like basically mauls you pretty much the entire time, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Also, something I thought was amusing is a sequence where Elvira has to crawl into this hole to get a key. I think it's what it was. And she was it's gratuitous as hell. First, a big shot of her ass crawling in there. There's a big boobs hanging out. She comes out. You know, anytime Elvira is on the screen, and there's another couple of points and where her she's just huge boobs are heaving. It's the only <laughs> animation on the screen. And her boobs just moving up and down, and she's breathing or talking. It's very eye catching. And I will say the attention to art, by the way, not to get too nasty about it, but they did a good job with her. Uh, all the even the hot monsters are good looking and. The way stuff gets killed in this is awesome. Some stuff's like you'll split it in half and it'll explode. Sometimes they melt and sometimes yeah, their heads get, get ripped off and their hands get... There's one guy that you cut his hand off, which I thought was pretty slick. There's definitely more animation in the second game, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. They did a good job and they didn't have to again. And again, like in the first one, there's all kinds of different ways you get killed and they, you'll, you'll see a guy, your guy with a, you know wounds all over his face or neck bite marks or whatever. <laughs> so, you know, the... Uh, uh, I, I was surprised. It's funny. I, I've played these games before, but I didn't realize that Accolade was the one that that that, that distributed these things because it's a kind of a departure from their usual fare on the Amiga. Uh, I remember them mostly for like your test drives, uh, your Hardball, Fourth and Inches, that sort of stuff. Star Control, Bar Games. This is sort of kind of out of the realm of the things they usually did. You know, but, you know, and I don't know if it was because, oh, maybe that's having no fire in your game get you a, you know, because actually a pretty big company at the right. time. Uh, so this was a, you know, I'd say this was sort of a departure from what they were, they were usually the one. Uh, but uh, good stuff. Again, did they use the Elvira license fully? It's a mixed bag because she's not in it really that much either. I mean, she's in the beginning. She'll, you know, you see her towards the beginning of the second game. Then you see her, you know, at the end. But she's not like she's out there battling with you or anything for the most part. Um, they, the, uh, we, did, I didn't cover this, and I don't know if you have anything on it. But there was a third game that Horsoft did. It was their last game. It was called Waxworks. Yeah, people seem to think that it's kind of a, uh, a spiritual successor. Right. And now I've, I've not played this game. I'd heard of it. I never played it. I didn't look at it for this review. Maybe it's something we'll look at down the, down the road. Because mm-hmm. if, if this, it, I'd, it got good reviews. And so maybe it's something I'd like to spend a little bit of time on looking at. But So I thought that was kind of neat that they, that they kept on trucking. These games are popular. So I'm kind of surprised that Horsoft didn't do much uh, after, after that. Uh, when they switched their name, they did a few other things. Uh, uh, off the Amiga, you know, but uh, uh, an interesting period, you know, and again, Elvira's popularity sort of, I, I would say it probably peaked in that, right in that area. Yeah. I don't, you know, that's yeah, about as big as she yeah. got. So it's funny how big it was. You don't even think about it, but she was everywhere. She was in commercials, beer commercials, oh, yeah. and everything back in the day. I even remember getting Valentine's in school, in elementary school <laughs> with Elvira on them. <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> that's crazy. Now, she wasn't the, uh, Main, she wasn't the main character in the first two games where we talked about, but the third game she absolutely was. Uh, we'll go ahead. You got anything else on those you want to throw no, out? Let's move on to Elvira the arcade game. Sure, uh, Elvira. Oh, just for the record, the the first the Elvira games one of the whack things. The first one was on five discs, and the second was on seven discs. Yeah, that's a lot of discs. <laughs> seven discs, man. Uh, that's that's. You know, and it's not the biggest game by any stretch of the imagination, but that's a lot of discs. And I can tell you from the Amiga, and I, I can't tell you for sure because I don't have, I don't use my drive now. I use that uh, my internal, you know, CF card. But uh, a lot of times the Amiga wouldn't support its second drive, and so if you had, like, I had two or three drives in, during my days. If you and if you, and it was great when a game would support those drives, but they almost always didn't support them, mm-hmm. and that was always disappointing because you had to swap it in that first drive over and over and over because you know they. I guess they were afraid of copy protection. That's why they did it. So. Yeah, 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 man. And it's funny because I, I, I don't know if you if you listened to the interview I did with Paul Shaw from Australia, but he said that Monkey Island came on something like twelve discs. Yes, Monkey Island is, a, is, a, is, and the thing about these games is when you're using that main drive over and over. I mean, you wear that thing down to the nub, you know. And yeah. so, uh, 
that's always a pain. And it was a concern of mine even back then. I'm like, man, I know I'm killing this drive. So n- nowadays, I don't boot off the drive if I don't have to. I'm mm-hmm. just going to let the fool with it. Anyway, uh, Elvira the Arcade Game. Now, this was done by an entire different outfit. Um, it was released in 91 and was not a role-playing game. This is a straight-up platformer, uh, if you will. Came on two de- discs, uh, unlike the five or seven. So you got that going for you. And it was developed and published by the same outfit, which was called, they were called Flare Software. And we don't mean the Nature Woo! Boy. Yeah, I knew that was coming. Uh, the Flare Software. Um, f- f- I looked up Flare, and it's funny. It, this is a typical thing, because I, I, I wasn't real familiar with Flare. Uh, they are a British game developer uh, in the 90s. They developed stuff for the Amiga, uh, the Atari ST, Commodore, DOS. And they actually had uh, an MSX release as well i looked over what they'd done um the things that stood out to me were i remember a game called dangerous streets um uh, i remember the game called oscar oscar is sort of a pretty famous game on the amiga and trolls those are the ones i remember the most most of the rest of the stuff <clears throat> i didn't didn't ring a bell for me they had some stuff called like summer olympics spell with an x mm. so i don't know <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> Maybe just a clone of Epix's game. Or? I don't know. I, I was afraid to look. Yeah, like, man, this you, could get this anything could get with an X in it. You never know. Um, they and they they kept on trucking and ended up. I think they ended up doing even doing some DX DS games. Really? Yeah. So they they were around for a while. It's funny. Again, I I would who knew right? Um, in in Elvira, the arcade game, which by the way was not released in an arcade. <laughs> or based on an arcade yeah. game. Um, you play as Elvira. You, uh, It's a straight-up platform, like I said. Uh, you start out on the screen where there's two big globes, right? There's, uh, there's the Underworld of Fire globe, and then there's the, Ar- the Arctic Earth globe, all right? You can pick whichever one you want, sort of a blood money thing. Pick, pick your level. Um, the uh, you jump around, you use spells to shoot. So it's basically a platform shooter. That, that is what it is. Mm-hmm. Elvira jumps in the most bizarre way possible. <laughs> she leaps chest first up in the air, <laughs> legs splayed, arms d- d- akimbo. It's crazy time. Uh, she just basically fights her way through the levels. She's got. Uh, She's got. She can pick up a, a power up, weapon power ups. Uh, she, you know, the controls are pretty simple: up, down, left, right. Of course, jump is on the stick, um, and crouch is, is is something you can do. Uh, you actually have to use the keyboard to do some of the spell stuff. Uh, the uh, if you beat the first two worlds, that third world opens up. Uh, which this is the uh, end game world, the Castle of Transylvania world. Uh, needless to say, I never got past any one world to see that. So I had to go and go and have a look at it on YouTube to see what the heck was going on with it. Um, what did you think of this one, Boat? As, a, as how did you think it played, and what did you think of the uh, overall uh, license use and how it compared to the other games? Well, this is more along the lines of what you can expect to see with most licensed games. Uh, you have kind of a uh, barely adequate platforming uh, physics engine. Um, you've got this hastily animated, though somewhat comically animated, Elvira. I mean, she looked pretty. I thought she was rendered pretty well. It just Her, the way she jumps is bizarre. Yeah, and the way yeah the way that she jumps and the the way that she's animated, I, I guess they did the best that they could. Um, but when you compare that to something like you know Simon Belmont, you know from Castlevania, walking through you know a horror landscape. The the animation is is much more smooth. I don't know if you ever played the Castlevania games. Actually, I thought Elvira looked pretty good animation. I thought. Really? Yeah, I thought you looked okay. All right. Well. I've seen some. I've seen those Castlevania games, and I didn't. I'm not a fan. Now that much said, I'm not comparing this to those uh, because I know there, there's a legion of fans, and I don't know enough about <laughs> them to compare them. But I, I thought as goofy as she looked, it was an, well animated, goofy. Well, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, the the biggest problem that I have with this is the difficulty. And the length of the levels, and they they are repetitive. Uh, and when I say that, I mean it's basically one level. It's just lots and lots of the same thing as you move along. Mm-hmm. Uh, I agree. Uh, this was not a game that I uh, played much back in the day, and uh, probably won't go back to it. But that much said, uh, it's interesting. It's got some, uh, and we didn't mention this in the first one. The the uh, the the 
the first two games for the Elvira role playing games had really good music, mm-hmm. which I thought was neat. Yeah, this absolutely. had this had pretty good music and mm-hmm. h- a hilarious thing is I wanted to see who was doing the music. Uh, the guy, a guy named Philip Nixon, did it, and he also worked on Elvira too. So there's your. He actually worked on two of the Elvira really? games for two different companies, which I thought was kind of neat. Um, he worked on a lot of Flair games as well. So I guess he was one of their house musicians over there that did a lot of music. Now compared to Fright Night, this is a masterpiece. I mean, it's well, it's it, yeah. this is a real game. Well, you know? it's graphically, and you know what it reminded me of. You ever put a game called Gods? Yes. The uh, the mm-hmm. way she shot and the way the 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 uh, the monsters exploded, mm-hmm. very gods like. Yeah. I, I I was wondering, and I couldn't. It's hard. I couldn't tell on Lemon Amiga. I looked up a couple other places to see who had actually done the graphics, and I couldn't find the exact name of the guys. But mm-hmm. I wonder if any of those guys went on to work on gods. There were some similarities other than that, but those are the two that really struck me. I was like, this is the way that the, just the way they shot and the way that the the, uh, the guys went up and these little kind of bubbles of flame. It was very gods like to me. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, I don't think this is as good as the role playing games. Um, it's not bad. We, it's funny because we we started off playing Adams Family pretty on pretty pretty early on, and I and so it kind of makes everything look kind of crummy in a way. <laughs> but I thought this was better than I thought this was. Is it better than even Super Frog? I don't know. It's in that ballpark. I mean, it's hard for me to 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 gauge that because the setting is so different. You know, Super Frog is real whimsical, and this is this is. I don't know. Now, I, there's no verticality in these levels, right? Well, I mean, you go, well, no. There, it, it's not like Super Frog. Si- no, 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 no. It's side-scrolling action, and but you kind of kind of go down at an mm-hmm. angle or yeah. j- jump back and forth. The The worlds looked pretty good, you know? The, the graphics were pretty good, mm-hmm. I thought, on the whole. There's an awesome opening sequence where Elvira's in bed, and then it kind of this camera kind of zooms in on her on her face and she's asleep. And then it zooms outside her house and kind of lightning strikes her front door and blows it off the hinges. And then her eyes pop open. I thought that was pretty slick. Mm-hmm. You know, there, all three of these games it feature some like I don't know the um, primitive animation. It's almost I don't know what it, uh, even what it's, you would describe it like. It's yeah, the animated it's, GIF, but much earlier. Right. It's the same kind of animation that the Super Frog intro is done in. I think. I mean, did like some of this was like it looked like it had been digitized and then and then drawn like over. rotoscoped. Yeah, yeah, uh, and the, I mean, all three of these games. One thing they had in common were really good graphics. It's borderline incredible graphics at times when they actually had a still a face on there. That someone had taken some time to go through and probably hand draw a photo. You know, that's I mean, you know, because Amiga of course had digitized. They probably digitized their voice or yeah. face and then, you know, sc- and scanned it in. But the opening for this is really outstanding. I really like that. Uh, what it has to do with the game, yeah. and, and I. The I, I trailed down the manual for this to get an idea of the controls and stuff, but I didn't really get into the backstory of it uh, if there was one. But uh, it was interesting. Like I said, the opening was cool. Opening all three of them were pretty cool. Actually, uh, or actually the opening. Oh, uh, something else we forgot to mention about the first one is the fact that there's a movie ad in there as it comes up, and it, it's it, and it has reviews of her movie, which I thought was funny and it was available. Which I thought that was kind of wacky. Yeah. Uh, but uh, overall, the three. This is the weakest. Uh, unless you just want to get a little twitch action going, and uh, you're better at it than I am. Again, it, it's kind of the jumping mechanics a little wacky uh, to uh, to uh, get used to, but uh, overall, a decent game. Probably another one I had to spend some more time with to to be sure of how I felt about it. But you know, it's it it, it gets by on some style points for sure. Yeah, and we'll be checking it out on the live stream after this. So. Right on. Um, well, uh, overall, Elvira. You know, she is what she is. I like her. These games, obviously, better than they probably have a right to be. Absolutely. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed uh, the Amigos October Spooktacular. Uh, next week, uh, we are going to be returning to some more mainstream fare mm. with uh, one of the um, best uh, coin op conversions slash enhancements uh, of all time, uh, Deluxe Galaga. Oh or yes, Galaga. Uh, depending on how you like to pronounce it. Uh, And uh, so look forward to that. And uh, as always, uh, if you have any comments or if you'd like to tell us your own Halloween haunted house stories, leave us a comment on the blog at AmigosPodcast.com. Or send us audio. I wouldn't mind hearing those. Whatever you want to do. We're we're ready for feedback. So uh, until next time, adios. adios.